casualty management, planning for an emergency. The prevention of accidents is obviously preferable to giving first aid. Nothing can replace adequate supervision of a child in a friendly and relaxed environment. Now and again, however, accidents and illness do happen and you may be called upon to give first aid to a child in your care. It is important, therefore, to make a plan for how you would deal with such an emergency situation. What would you do if a child in your care has a serious accident or sudden illness? What if that accident or illness happened to you? Take some time to consider what your actions would be if an emergency happened whilst you were caring for children. Useful things to consider when you make your plan. Access to a telephone and a backup if it's out of order. Do you have someone who can care for your children if you have to leave them? Do you have a fully equipped first aid box that is easy for you and others to find? Are the children's record forms to hand so you can take them to hospital with you? Do you have a fire escape plan? What if the exits or stairs were blocked? Do you have an agreed meeting point outside? Do the parents know what to expect if there is an emergency and what you will ask of them? Make a list of important phone numbers that you and others can find easily. Parents of the children, home, work and mobile. Doctor's surgery, yours and the children's. Emergency backup person. Ofsted advisor or childminding network coordinator. Have you been on a first aid course to learn what to do in an emergency? Just watching this video is not enough. Useful information when calling for help. Location of the accident. Which emergency services are required? What happened? Casualties condition, breathing, unconscious, injuries. Number of casualties. The role of the paediatric first aider. First aid is defined as the help given to a sick or injured person until full medical treatment is available. The responsibilities of a first aider include assessing the situation, work out what has happened, count the number of casualties, look for history, signs and symptoms, protecting from danger, assess for further dangers, protect yourself first, then protect others, getting help, Ask bystanders for assistance. Work out what help is needed. Call for help or ask a bystander to call. Recognise your own limitations. Prioritising treatment. Treat the most urgent thing first. Treat the most urgent person first. Offer support and comfort. Minimising infection risks. Wash hands before and after giving help. Wear disposable gloves. Wear protective clothing if needed. Cover your own cuts with a plaster. Dispose of contaminated waste carefully. Use sterile, undamaged, in-date dressings. Reporting and recording. Accurately record incidents. Report accidents when necessary. Maintain confidentiality. The aims of first aid. Preserve life prevent the situation worsening, and promote recovery. Consent. It is important to ask for the casualty's consent before giving first aid. Believe it or not, just touching someone without their permission could be classed as assault. If a casualty is unconscious, however, the law allows you to assume that they give consent to your help. If a casualty refuses treatment but you think they need it urgently, call 999-112 for emergency help. Surveying the scene. Let's explore this scenario. There has been a serious accident. What things should you consider before treating anyone? What happened? Working this out could answer some of the following questions. Further danger? Can it happen again? Is there a risk of fire, explosion, collapse, chemicals, traffic, electricity, gas, drowning, etc.? Can you cope? Ask bystanders to help. Use others to make the scene safe, for example, traffic control at road incidents. Avoid individual tasks. 
take charge and give jobs to others instead. Number of casualties. This information is vital for emergency services. How many appear seriously injured? Emergency services. What is the exact location? Fire and rescue? Ambulance? Police? Who needs help first? Assess casualties using the primary survey. If there are multiple casualties, tell others what to do. Minimising risk. PPE. Personal protective equipment. Always try to use PPE when administering first aid, including aprons, gloves, face shields and face masks. Do not delay emergency patient care if PPE is not available. COVID-19. Coronavirus. Due to the current climate with COVID-19, it has never been more important to ensure your own safety first and foremost before others. Should you need to perform first aid or CPR, please ensure you are protected at all times. If in any doubt, call 999 or 112 for an emergency. For non-emergencies, call 111 for further support. Do not place yourself at unnecessary risks. Priorities of treatment, the primary survey. We need a constant supply of oxygen to survive. If our brain cells don't get oxygen, they start to die within three to four minutes. The priorities of treatment are making sure oxygen gets into the blood and that the blood carries it to the brain. The primary survey is a fast and systematic way to find and treat life-threatening conditions in priority order. If a life-threatening condition is found, it should be treated immediately before moving on to the next step. Use DRABC, Dr. ABC, to remember the primary survey sequence. Perform a primary survey first on every casualty and until it's complete, do not be distracted by more superficial, non-life-threatening conditions. D. Danger. Make sure you, the casualty and any bystanders are safe. Don't put your own life at risk. One casualty is enough. R. Response. Quickly check to see if the casualty is conscious. Gently shake or tap the shoulders and ask loudly, are you all right? Unconscious casualties take priority and need urgent treatment. If an unconscious casualty is on their back, the airway can be at risk. A. Airway. Identify and treat any life-threatening airway problems. If the casualty is unconscious, tilt the head back to open the airway. When the airway is clear, opened, move on to breathing. Life-threatening conditions. Airway swelling, narrowing or blockage caused by the tongue, vomit, choking, burns, strangulation, hanging, anaphylaxis. B. Breathing. Identify and treat any life-threatening breathing problems. If the casualty is unconscious and not breathing normally, perform CPR. When life-threatening breathing problems have been ruled out or treated, move on to circulation. Life-threatening conditions. Asthma. Crushing of the chest. Chest injury. Collapsed lung. Poisoning. Anaphylaxis. Cardiac arrest. C. Circulation. Identify and treat any life-threatening circulation problems. When life-threatening circulation problems have been ruled out or treated, the primary survey is complete. You can now look for other, less urgent problems, such as broken bones. Life-threatening conditions. Heart attack, heart failure, severe bleeding, poisoning, anaphylaxis, cardiac arrest. Multiple casualties. Use the DRABC primary survey to decide who needs treatment first. A rough rule of thumb is that the casualty who is the quietest needs treatment first, whereas the one making the most noise, trying to get your attention, is the least serious. Recognizing life-threatening conditions. During the primary survey, it is important to recognize and treat any life-threatening conditions. As a rule, a condition is life-threatening if it interferes with oxygen getting through to the vital organs of the body. If the body has a lack of oxygen, we call this hypoxia. 
The body's emergency response. If the body detects low oxygen levels, the emergency hormone adrenaline is released, which diverts blood away from the skin and stomach, diverts blood towards the heart, lungs, and brain, increases the heart rate, increases the strength of the heartbeat and blood pressure, opens the air passages in the lungs. Adrenaline creates dramatic signs and symptoms that the first aider must be able to recognize. Recognition of hypoxia. Pale, clammy skin. For darker skin, look at the color of the skin inside the lips. Blue tinges to the skin and lips. Cyanosis. Increase in pulse rate. Nausea or vomiting. Increased breathing rate if the brain detects low oxygen. Lowered breathing rate indicates a brain problem. Distressed breathing or gasping. Confusion or dizziness. These signs and symptoms are caused by adrenaline. We will now look at first aid kits. Health and Safety, First Aid, Regulations 1981. Employers' Responsibilities. Under Health and Safety Law, an employer has a responsibility to ensure that first aid provision in the workplace is sufficient. This includes Carrying out a first aid needs assessment to decide where, how many, and what type of first aiders are needed. Providing training and refresher training for those first aiders. Providing sufficient first aid kits and equipment for the workplace. Ensuring that all staff are aware of how and where to get first aid treatment. First aid kits. First aid kits should be identified by a white cross on a green background. Most workplace first aid kits conform to British Standard BS8599 and are available in different sizes to suit the environment. Some of the items stored in a first aid kit are gloves, face shields, adhesive tape, foil blanket, triangular bandages, conforming bandages, cleansing wipes, plasters, wound dressings, iPads, finger dressings, burn dressings, and scissors. If there is no mains tap water, have at least one litre of sterile water available for eye washing. This table reflects the latest HSE recommended contents of a first aid kit depending on the amount of employees, visitors, adults or children in your organisation. Please note, tablets and medicines should not be stored in a first aid kit because first aiders are not trained to administer or dispense them. We shall now look at record keeping. Accident book. Any accident at work, no matter how small, must be recorded in an accident book. The accident book may be filled in by any person on behalf of the casualty, or indeed by the casualty themselves. The information recorded can help the employer identify accident trends and possible areas of improvement in the control of health and safety risks. It can be used for future first aid needs assessments and may be helpful for insurance investigative purposes. Filling in the accident book is often done by the first aider, so the following notes are given for your advice. An accident book is a legal document. Anything that has been written down at the time of an accident is usually considered to be stronger evidence in court than something recalled from memory. Complete the report all at the same time, using the same pen, not pencil. To comply with the General Data Protection Regulation 2018, Personal details entered in accident books must be kept confidential, so the book should be designed so that individual record sheets can be removed and stored securely. A member of staff should be nominated to be responsible for the safekeeping of completed accident records, for example in a lockable cabinet. Hand the completed accident record to that person. The person who had the accident may wish to take a photocopy of the report. If this is the case, they can do this before it is handed in. They should keep a record of the accident report number.
you should include in the report the name, address and occupation of the person who had the accident. The name, address, occupation and signature of the person who is completing the report. The date, time and location of the accident. A description of how the accident happened, giving the cause if you can. Details of the injury suffered. First Aid Casualty Report Form It is useful for a first aider to complete a casualty report form for every casualty treated. Please note this does not replace the accident book, which would still have to be completed for an accident at work. The casualty report form is designed so that the first aider can keep a record of the exact treatment provided. It is particularly useful if a casualty refuses treatment against the advice of the first aider. If a casualty refuses treatment, make sure they are capable of making that decision. For example, a fully conscious adult. Seek medical advice if they are not. Follow the advice given for completing the accident book when completing the form. A copy of the form can be given to ambulance or hospital staff, as it will contain valuable information about the incident and treatment of the casualty. Ask the nurse to take a copy so you can keep the original. To comply with the General Data Protection Regulation 2018, personal details on the report form must be kept confidential so the report should be stored securely, for example, in a lockable cabinet. AVPU score, pronounced AVPU score. A simple way to record the conscious level of casualty is to use the AVPU scale. The scale is listed on the casualty report form, so you don't have to remember it. There is a score provided next to each level of consciousness. Write the score in the observations chart each time you measure it. In this video, we will teach you what to do if you found someone collapse. The initial assessment is called a primary survey. This is a quick, early assessment to establish how best to treat or casualty in order of priority. We can use the initials Dr. ABC or DRABC to remind us of the steps we need to follow. These initials stand for danger, response, airway, breathing, and circulation. So, when I see a casualty first, I'm going to check for any danger to make sure it's safe for me to approach them. I don't want to become a casualty myself. Then I'm going to see if I can get a response from the casualty. As you approach, introduce yourself. Ask them questions to try to get a response. If they're not alert and do not respond to your voice, kneel down beside them and gently shake their shoulders. Hello, Amy. It's Winston. Can you hear me? Open your eyes. Still in response, you can pinch the earlobe to see if they respond to pain. Depending on how the casualty responds to you, will establish a level of response. We use the AVPU scale and each letter can represent the casualty's level of response. A. Alert. V. Response to voice. P. Response to pain. And U. Is the casualty unresponsive to stimuli? If there is still no response, they are unresponsive. We need to check the airway. Is the casualty alert and speaking to you? You know that there's no problem with the airway, it is clear. If the casualty is unresponsive, open the airway by putting one hand on the forehead and gently tilting the head back with two fingers under the, the chin. Now we need to check to see if they are breathing normally. We do this by placing our air and cheek over their nose and mouth looking down the body to see if the chest rises and falls. We do this for 10 seconds. If the casualty is not breathing normally, call for help. Ask them to call 999 or 112 for emergency help and bring an AED. If you are alone, call for emergency help using a mobile on speakerphone and begin CPR with chest compressions. The casualty is breathing normally, 
So I'm going to check their circulation. Are there any signs of severe bleeding? Look and check down the body. If you find severe bleeding, try to control the bleeding to prevent life-threatening shock. Call 999 or 112 for emergency help before continuing to treat the casualty. You may also need to treat them for shock. I've established that my casualty is not bleeding. So remember, to do a primary survey, follow the order of Dr. ABC. Complete each step in that order as quickly as possible, dealing with any life-threatening conditions as you find them. Call for emergency help. Call 999 or 112. And that's how we perform a primary survey. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St. John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate. The Secondary Survey The primary and secondary surveys give a systematic way to prioritise urgent treatment and then thoroughly assess the casualty. When the primary survey is complete and you have dealt with any life-threatening conditions, it is safe to examine the casualty head to toe, checking for other injuries or illness in a methodical manner. If the casualty is unconscious, it is vital that you continually monitor and protect the airway, breathing and circulation. These are the primary survey priorities to keep the casualty alive until emergency help arrives. So, how do we do this? Start by considering the history, signs and symptoms. History What happened? What is the casualty's medical history? Do they have allergies? What medication do they take? When did they last eat? What forces were involved in the accident? And what are the worst injuries this could have caused? Tip Treat for the worst. Signs. Look for clues such as pale skin, cyanosis, flushed skin, fast, slow, weak or irregular pulse, abnormal breathing, smell such as alcohol, swelling, deformity. Symptoms. Ask the casualty how they feel. Do they have pain? Where is it? Can they describe it? Does anything make it worse or better? When did it start? How severe is it? Does the casualty have any other feelings, such as sickness, dizziness, feeling hot or cold, hunger or thirst? Sample. Sample can be used to remember some important things to ask the casualty. S. Signs and symptoms. How do they look and feel? A. Allergies. Do they have any? M. Medication. Are they on any? P. Past medical history. Do they have any? L. Last meal. When and what? E. Event history. What happened? The casualty's eyes. Looking into a casualty's eyes, without making them feel uncomfortable, as you speak to them, may also assist you in figuring out if something else could be wrong, or if their condition is much worse than you originally thought. Do they appear to have difficulty focusing or seeing clearly? Do their eyes appear to be working normally? This is something you may check even after a head injury. Look for irregularities such as pinpoint pupils, unequal pupils, dilated pupils. Head to toe check. Next, check the casualty from head to toe. Protect their dignity and ask permission if possible. Wear disposable gloves and don't move them more than necessary. So. 
How do you perform a head to toe check? Head to toe check. Number one, head and neck. Has the casualty had an accident that might have injured the spine? Assess the breathing. Is it fast or slow? Shallow or deep? Difficult or normal? Assess the pulse. Is it fast or slow? Strong or weak? Regular or irregular? Check the size of the pupils. Are they equal? Check the whole head and face. Clues to injury could be bruising, swelling, deformity, bleeding, or discharge from the ear or nose. Number two, shoulders and chest. Compare opposite shoulders and collarbones. Are there signs of a fracture? Ask the casualty to take a deep breath. Does the chest move easily and equally on both sides? Does this cause pain? Look for injuries such as stab wounds or bleeding. Number three, abdomen. Check the abdomen for abnormality or response to pain. Look for incontinence or bleeding. Do not squeeze or rock the pelvis. Numbers four and five, legs and arms. Ask the casualty if they can move their arms, legs, and all the joint without causing pain. Check each limb for the signs of a fracture, deformity, or bleeding. Number six, clues. Look for clues, such as medic alert bracelets, needle marks, medication, etc. Loosen tight clothing. Have a reliable witness if you check or remove items from pockets or bags. Avoid this if you suspect there could be sharp objects, such as needles. Caution. If the casualty is unconscious, it is vital that you continually monitor and protect the airway, breathing and circulation until emergency help arrives. Let's recap. In order to perform a head-to-toe check, you should check Number 1. The casualty's head and neck area Number 2. The casualty's shoulders and chest areas Number 3. The casualty's abdomen area Number 4 and 5. The casualty's legs and arms Number 6. For clues, such as medic alert bracelets, needle marks medication, etc. If you've done a primary survey and established that your casualty is unresponsive but breathing normally, they should be placed into the recovery position to help maintain the airway. To do this, Kneel next to them on the floor. Remove their glasses and any bulky objects in their pockets, but do not search their pockets for small items. Make sure both of the casualties' legs are straight. Then take the arm nearest to you and place it at a right angle to the body with the palm facing upwards, like so. Take the other arm and bring across their chest and place the back of their hand against their cheek nearest to you and hold it there. With your other hand, lift the far knee up until their foot is flat on the floor. Whilst keeping the casualty's hand pressed against their cheek, pull on the far leg and carefully roll the casualty towards you and onto their side, like so. Once you've done this, adjust the top leg so that it is at a right angle. Tilt the casualty's head back so that the air remains open. If needed, adjust the hand under the cheek to help to keep the airway open. If it has not already been done, call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Keep checking the level of response until help arrives. So remember, if the casualty stops breathing at any time, call 999 or 112 and prepare to give them CPR. 
and that's how you place someone in the recovery position. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St. John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate. When someone has a spinal injury, the greatest risk is their spinal cord may be temporarily or permanently damaged. If a casualty has suffered an abnormal force to the neck or back and is complaining of changes in sensation or difficulty in moving, they could have a spinal injury. You must take care not to unnecessarily move their head, neck or spine. Some of the following incidents could indicate a possible spinal injury. They could have fallen from a height, such as from a ladder. Fallen awkwardly when doing gymnastics. From diving into a shallow pool and hitting the bottom. A collapsed rugby scrum. Fallen awkwardly from a horse or motorbike. They could have experienced sudden deacceleration in a car. Had an injury to the head or face. Or had a heavy object fall across their back. If you suspect someone has a spinal injury, there are several key things to look for. They may have pain in their neck or back where the injury occurred, have bruising and tenderness in the skin over the spine, an irregular twist in the normal curve of the spine, have breathing difficulties, loss of bladder and or bowel control. They may lose control of their limbs, may lose sensation or have abnormal sensations such as tingling or burning, or their limbs feel stiff, heavy or clumsy. If you think they have a spinal injury, reassure the casualty and advise them not to move. Call 999 or 112 for emergency help. You should then kneel or lie behind the casualty's head, rest your elbows on the ground or on your knees to help keep your arms steady. Hold each side of their head with your fingers spread so their ears are not covered and they can still hear you. Support their head in this position so their head, neck and spine are aligned. While you support their head, ask a helper to place rolled up blankets, towels or clothes on either side of the casualty's head. Make sure you continue to hold this position until emergency help arrives. Do not move the casualty from the position that you have found them in, unless they are in immediate danger and it's safe for you to do so. Monitor their level of response until help arrives. If they become unresponsive at any point, prepare to treat an unresponsive casualty. So remember, if you suspect a spinal injury, reassure them and call 999 or 112. Don't move them. Support their head and neck until help arrives. And that's how you help someone with a spinal injury. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate. Shock is a serious life-threatening condition that happens when vital organs in the body are not getting enough blood flow and this can lead to failure of these organs and the heart. Shock can be caused by anything that reduces the circulation or blood flow, such as severe bleeding, which you may be able to see or it may be hidden and internal. If the heart is unable to pump blood around the body after problems like a heart attack, severe heart disease or heart failure. Loss of bodily fluid following severe vomiting, diarrhoea or severe burns. After a severe allergic reaction or severe infection and following a spinal cord injury. These conditions may all lead to life-threatening shock. When someone is in shock they may have a fast pulse, pale, cold or clammy skin, sweating, fast, shallow breathing, grey-blue skin, especially inside the lips, weakness and dizziness, nausea and possible vomiting, thirst. As the shock becomes more severe, they may have a weak pulse that you may not be able to feel, restless and aggressive behaviour, gasping for air, they may become unresponsive. To treat for shock, you need to try to reverse the cause of shock. 
If you find severe bleeding or serious burns, try to treat these whilst reassuring the casualty. Help the casualty to lie down. If possible, try to lie them down on a rug or blanket, as this will help protect them from the cold. Raise and support their legs above the level of their heart, as this will increase blood flow to the head and vital organs. But if the casualty has an injured leg, do not raise it. If the casualty is pregnant, help them to lie with their body leaning towards their left side to prevent obstruction of blood flow returning to the heart. If you haven't done so already, call 999 or 112 and tell ambulance control that you suspect shock. Once you have called for emergency help, you can then loosen any tight clothing around their neck, chest and waist. Stay with the casualty and keep them warm by covering them with a blanket or coats. Try to reassure them and keep them calm. Keep monitoring their level of response. If they become unresponsive, open their airway, check their breathing and prepare to treat someone who is unresponsive. So remember, if you think someone is in shock, treat the cause of shock. Lay them down and raise their legs. Call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Loosen any tight clothing and keep them warm and calm. Monitor their level of response. And that's how we treat shock. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate. When bleeding is severe, it can be dramatic and distressing. If someone's bleeding isn't controlled quickly, they may develop a life-threatening condition called shock and they may become unresponsive. Bleeding from the mouth or nose may affect their breathing. So try to ensure that the airway is kept clear. An obstructed airway can be a cause for a casualty to become unresponsive. If the casualty becomes unresponsive at any point, open the airway and check their breathing and prepare to treat an unresponsive casualty. To treat someone with a severe bleed, put gloves on if you have them, as this will help to protect you both from infection. If the wound is covered by clothing, remove or cut the clothes to uncover the wound. Is there an object in the wound? If there is, don't pull it out because it may be acting as a plug to reduce the bleeding. Instead, leave it in and apply pressure on either side of it to push the edges together. If there is no object in the wound, apply direct pressure on the wound with your fingers and use a sterile dressing or clean non-fluffy pad to stop the bleeding. If you don't have a dressing, ask the casualty to apply direct pressure themselves to stop the bleeding. Jenny, can you apply some pressure for me please? Brilliant, excellent, well done. Ask a helper to call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Or if you're on your own, use a mobile on speakerphone so you can keep treating the casualty. Tell the emergency services where the bleeding is coming from and the amount of bleeding. The casualty may develop shock, so help them to lie down on a blanket or rug if there's one to protect them from the cold. Raise and support their legs so they are above the level of their heart. Do not raise the leg if it is injured. Jenny, could I lay you down? Thanks. Okay. Just gonna lift your legs up. Feel okay? Secure the dressing with a bandage that is firm enough to maintain the pressure but doesn't cut off the circulation. Okay, just gonna apply this dressing for you, please. Take your hand away. There you go. Okay. Can you hold up for me? Excellent. Take it like this. Okay. Check the circulation by pressing a nail bed or skin beyond the bandage for five seconds. Release the pressure. And if the color does not return within two seconds, the bandage is too tight. If blood shows through the dressing, don't remove it. Just apply a second bandage on top. Take it like this. Okay. Here, like 
If blood shows through both dressings, remove them and apply a fresh bandage ensuring there is direct pressure applied at the point of bleeding. Support the injured part with a sling or bandage, but check circulation every 10 minutes. Keep monitoring the casualty's level of response while waiting for help to arrive. So remember, when treating severe bleeding, wear gloves if available. Remove or cut away any clothing from around the wound. Check for objects in the wound but don't remove them. Apply pressure on either side of the wound. If there is no object in the wound, use a dressing or pad and apply direct pressure to the wound. Call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Secure the dressing with a bandage. Treat the casualty for shock. Support the injured area. Keep checking their level of response while waiting for help. And that's how we treat someone with a severe bleed. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St. John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate. If after performing a primary survey, you find someone who is unresponsive and not breathing normally, call for help. Ask someone to call 999 or 112 and ask them to bring an AD if one is available while you begin CPR immediately. If you're on your own, make the call yourself, ideally by using a mobile on speakerphone so that you can begin CPR as soon as possible. You will need to start with chest compressions. Kneel down beside the casualty's chest, place one hand center on the chest, and place the heel of your other hand on top and interlock your fingers to lift them off the ribs. Lean over the casualty with your arms straight and press down on the chest to five to six centimeters. Release the pressure, allowing the chest to come back up without removing your hands from the chest. Repeat this to give 30 chest compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. This is quite fast. To help you keep pace, you can sing Staying Alive. After 30 chest compressions, you need to give rescue breaths. If you have not been trained or unwilling or unable to give rescue breaths, Continue with chest compressions only until help arrives or the casualty becomes responsive. To give rescue breaths, make sure the airway is open by tilting the head back with one hand on the forehead and two fingers under the chin. Pinch the soft part of the nose and allow their mouth to fall open. Take a deep breath and seal your mouth around theirs. Blow steadily into their mouth, giving a rescue breath in about one second. Their chest will rise. Remove your mouth from theirs and watch their chest fall. Give them two rescue breaths like this. Continue to alternate 30 chest compressions and two rescue breaths. If someone can help you perform CPR, you can swap over every one to two minutes with minimal interruption to chest compressions. If there is someone there who can help, if they have brought you an AED, ask them to turn it on and follow the instructions while you continue CPR. Continue CPR until emergency help arrives and takes over. The casualty starts to show signs of becoming responsive. They start breathing normally or opening their eyes or you become too exhausted to continue. If they do start breathing normally, again, place them in the recovery position, monitor them and prepare to start CPR again if necessary. So remember, if you come across an adult who is unresponsive and not breathing normally, call for help. Ask a caller to call 999 or 112 for emergency help and ask them to bring an AED. If you're on your own, make the call yourself, ideally by using a mobile on speakerphone so that you can begin CPR. Give 30 chest compressions, followed by two rescue breaths, 
continue giving 30 compressions and two rescue breaths until help arrives or they become responsive. If an aid is available, continue CPR while the instructions from the device are followed by your helper. And that's how we perform CPR. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St. John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate. If after performing a primary survey, you find a child who is unresponsive and not breathing normally, call for help. Ask someone to phone 999 or 112 and ask them to bring an AED if one is available while you begin CPR immediately. If you're by yourself and do not have a speakerphone, start CPR with 5 initial rescue breaths, then 30 chest compressions and 2 rescue breaths for 1 minute before calling for help. To give rescue breaths, open the airway by tilting the head back with one hand on the forehead and two fingers under the chin. Pickle any obstructions from their mouth to clear the airway, only if you can clearly see something. Keeping their head in this position, pinch the soft part of their nose, allow their mouth to fall open. Take a deep breath and seal your mouth around theirs. Blow steadily into their mouth giving a rescue breath in about one second. Their chest will rise. Remove your mouth from theirs and watch their chest fall. Give them five initial rescue breaths at about one breath per second, like this. To do chest compressions, kneel on mother child beside their chest. Place only one hand on the center of the chest. Lean over the child with your arms straight and press down vertically one third of its depth. Release the pressure. Allow the chest to come back up without removing your hand from the chest. Repeat this to give 30 chest compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. This is quite fast, and to help you, you can sing Nelly the Elephant, which can help you to keep up with the pace. After 30 chest compressions, open the airway and give them a further to rescue breaths. Continue to alternate between 30 chest compressions and 2 rescue breaths until help arrives. If you are on your own and don't have a speakerphone, stop after 1 minute and call 999 or 112 for emergency help. If a mobile phone is not available and you have to move to get a telephone, take the child with you if you are able. Do not leave the child to look for an AED. The emergency services will bring one with them. If there is someone there who can help, if they have brought an AED, ask them to turn it on and follow instructions while you continue CPR. If they can help you perform CPR, you can swap over every 1-2 to two minutes with minimal interruptions to chest compressions. Continue CPR until emergency help arrives and takes over. The child starts to show signs of becoming responsive. They start breathing normally or opening their eyes or you become too exhausted to continue. If they do start breathing normally again, put them in the recovery position. So remember, if you come across a child that's unresponsive and not breathing normally, call for help. Tell a helper to call 999 or 112 straight away and ask them to bring an AED. Give five initial rescue breaths, then 30 chest compressions followed by 2 rescue breaths. Continue giving 30 chest compressions to 2 rescue breaths until help arrives or the child starts to breathe. 
and that's how we perform CPR on a child. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St. John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate. If you ever find your baby is not responding to you, you will give them the best chance of survival if you know what to do. If you have found your baby unresponsive and not breathing normally, you will need to perform baby CPR. Call for help. Ask a helper to call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Use a mobile speakerphone if you're on your own so you can start CPR as soon as possible. If you're on your own and you don't have a speakerphone, you need to do CPR for a minute before you can call for help. Place them on a firm surface and open their airway. With one hand on the forehead, gently tilt their head back. With your fingertip, gently lift the chin to open the airway. Pick out any visible obstructions from the mouth and nose. Step one is puff. Take a breath, put your lips around your baby's mouth and nose and make a seal. Blow gently and steadily for up to one second. The chest should rise. Remove your mouth and watch the chest fall. That's one rescue breath or puff. Do this five times. Step two is pump or chest compressions. Put two fingers in the center of your baby's chest and push down a third of the depth of the chest. Release the pressure, allowing the chest to come back up before pressing back down again. Repeat this 30 times at a rate of 100 to 120 pumps per minute. This is quite quick. After 30 chest pumps, open the airway and give a further two puffs. Continue to alternate between 30 chest pumps and two puffs. If you're on your own and don't have a speakerphone, stop after one minute and call 999 or 112 for emergency help. If a mobile phone is not available and you have to move to get to a telephone, take the baby with you. Keep repeating 30 pumps, then two puffs until help arrives or they become responsive. So remember, if your baby is unresponsive and not breathing, call for help. Ask a helper to call 999 or 112 for emergency help. If you're on your own, use a speakerphone and start CPR as soon as possible. If you don't have a speakerphone, do CPR for a minute before calling for emergency help. Give five initial puffs, covering both the nose and mouth. Then 30 chest pumps with two fingers to the center of the chest. Continue CPR with 30 pumps and two puffs until help arrives. And that's how you do baby CPR. Thanks for watching. Help support St. John Ambulance. Donate today. An AED is a life-saving device that can give your heart an electric shock when it has stopped in a cardiac arrest. AED is short for Automated External Defibrillator. An AED can be used on adults and children over one year old. Using an AED in crucial minutes before numbers arrives can increase someone's chance of survival. Anyone can use an AED. You don't need to be worried about getting it wrong or causing harm because the machine analyzes the cause's heart's rhythm and then gives visual or voice prompts to guide you through each step. If someone is unresponsive and not breathing normally, ask someone to call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Ask them to bring an AED if one is available. If you're alone, make the emergency call yourself on a mobile phone or speakerphone and start CPR with chest compressions. Do not leave the casualty to look for an AED. Keep doing CPR 
until someone brings an AED. As soon as the AED arrives, ask for it to be switched on while CPR is continued. It will immediately start to give you a series of visual and verbal prompts informing you of what needs to be done. If someone is with you, ask them to follow the instructions until emergency help arrives. Call for help now. Remove all clothing from patient's chest. Pull red handle to open bag. Look at pictures on pads. Peel one pad off blue plastic. Apply pad to bare skin, exactly as shown in the picture. Press pad firmly. Peel other pad off blue plastic. Apply pad to bare skin, exactly as shown in the picture. Evaluating heart rhythm. Stop compression, Susan. Stand back. Stand by. Prepare Stand clear, everyone. Shock. Everyone clear. Do not touch patient. Stand back. Shock. Shock delivered. Provide chest compressions and rescue breaths. The AD would instruct you to continue CPR for two minutes before it reanalyzes. The AD could say, no shock advice, continue CPR. If the casualty shows signs of becoming responsive, place them in the recovery position. Leave the AED attached. Continue to follow the voice and or visual prompts that the machine gives you until help arrives. So remember, when using an AED, call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Continue giving CPR when the AED arrives and keeps going while the pads are applied, if possible. Ensure that the pads are placed on the chest after COVID has been cleared or cut away. Ask for the AED to be switched on and follow the instructions. Ask people to stand back when the AED is analyzing and when any shocks are being delivered. And that's how you use an AED. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St. John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate. Burns and scalds are damage to the skin caused by heat. A burn is usually caused by dry heat and a scald is caused by wet heat. You need to stop the burning by cooling the burn as soon as possible. This will decrease the severity of the injury. If someone has a severe burn, they may develop shock, which is a life-threatening condition, and they will need to get to the hospital as soon as possible. There are five signs which may be seen when someone has a burn or scald. Red skin, swelling, blisters on the skin, peeling skin, or the skin may be white or scorched. If someone has a burn or scald, move them away from the source of the heat to stop the burn getting any worse. Then start cooling the burn as quickly as possible. Place it under cool running water for at least 10 minutes or until the pain feels better. Don't use ice, gels or creams as this could damage the tissue and increase the risk of infection. If the burn looks like a serious burn or it's to a child, it's larger than the size of the casualty's hand, it's a burn to their face, hands or feet, or if it's a deep burn then call 999 or 112 for emergency help. If possible, get someone to do this for you while you continue to cool the burn or use a speakerphone if you're on your own. Gently remove any jewellery or clothing near the burn unless it's stuck to it. When the burn has cooled, cover it lengthways with cling film, get rid of the first two turns of film and then apply it lengthways over the burn. Use a plastic bag if you have no kitchen film. This will protect the burn from infection.
Never burst any blisters which may have formed as this may increase the risk of infection. Do not use ointments or fats to treat the burns as this may increase the risk of infection. Special burns, dressings and gels are not recommended. You may also need to treat the casualty for shock. So remember, when treating burns and scalds, move the casualty away from the heat source, place the burn under cool running water for at least 10 minutes. If it's larger than their hand, a deep burn, they're a child, the burn is on their face, their hands or their feet, call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Treat them for shock if necessary, and that's how you treat a burn or scold. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St John Ambulance by going to saa.org.uk forward slash donate. If you think someone has had a head injury, there are six key things you may find. They may have become unresponsive, even if for a short time. They may be a scalp wound. They may complain of dizziness or nausea. They may have memory loss of events at the time of the injury or before the injury occurred. They may complain of a headache. They may be confused. If you are worried about someone, who has had a head injury, you should get medical advice. With someone who has had a severe head injury, you may find that they have had a severe blow to the head, unresponsiveness or a deteriorating level of response, leakage of blood or watery fluid from the ear or nose, unequal pupil size. If a casualty has any of the signs of a severe head injury, seek emergency medical help. To treat someone with a minor head injury, sit them down and give them something cold to hold against the injury like an ice pack or frozen vegetables wrapped in a cloth. Amy, can you just put the injury? Thank you so much. Assess their level of response using the AVPU scale. Ask yourself, A, is the casualty alert? Are the eyes open? Do they respond appropriately to commands? V. Does the casualty respond to your voice? Can she answer simple questions? P. Does the casualty only respond to pain? If you pinch the earlobe, do they open their eyes? U. Are they unresponsive to any of the above? If they can respond normally, the head injury is probably minor. Keep monitoring their level of response, breathing, and watch for any changes. Treat any scalp wounds like a bleed by applying direct pressure to the wound. When the casualty has recovered, ask a responsible person to monitor and look after them. If a casualty has sustained an injury to the head while playing sports, do not allow them to return to the sport until they have been fully assessed by a medical practitioner. Advise to seek medical advice if their condition gets worse, they're over 65, they've had previous brain surgery, they're taking anti-clotting medication, they've been drinking or taking drugs, or if there's no responsible person to look after them. If you check their level of response and they're not alert, and so you think that they've had a severe head injury, Call 999 or 112 for emergency help and tell them that you suspect a head injury. If you can, use a speakerphone so that you can continue to treat the casualty whilst making the call for help. If they're unresponsive but breathing normally, following a head injury, open the airway in the position that they were found just in case they have sustained a spinal injury as well. This is to reduce further movements to the neck. Call 999 or 112 for emergency help. Continue to monitor the levels of response while waiting for help to arrive. If you think someone with a minor head injury is getting worse, they may show these signs. Increased drowsiness, persistent headache, confusion, dizziness, difficulty walking, difficulty speaking, 
vomiting, double vision, seizures. If you're concerned, call 999 or 112 for emergency help and monitor their level of response. So remember, when treating a minor head injury, sit them down, treat any scalp wounds, and check their level of response. If they have a severe head injury, call 999 or 112 for emergency help. And that's how we treat someone with a head injury. If this video has been helpful to you, help support St. John Ambulance by going to sja.org.uk forward slash donate.